our next speaker is uh, Dr. David Gendelberg, um, who will give us a talk on pediatric spine trauma, similarities and differences from the adult experience. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Today I'm going to speak about um, pediatric spine trauma. While there are many similarities to adults, there are also a variety of differences. And so I'll kind of focus on the salient features and differences between adult and pediatric trauma. So during this talk, I will go over the epidemiology, the anatomic and biomechanical differences between the pediatric population and adults, acute management of pediatric trauma, pediatric specific injury patterns, as well as uh, different technical considerations when surgery is indicated. Um, depending on the spine series, um, pediatric spine injuries account for 5 to 10 percent of all spine injuries and 5 percent of all spinal cord injuries. Interestingly, pediatric injuries are also associated with higher mortality rates compared to adult injuries. And this is thought that this is due to the higher energy required um, to cause pediatric spine injuries. Um, as kids are frequently poor historians, pediatric spine injuries are frequently missed. And in fact, reports estimate that up to 50% of injuries are missed on initial exam and evaluation. Um, despite the advances in automotive um, engineering, uh, the use of seat belts and drunk driving um, laws, uh, motor vehicles still account for the highest um, proportion of pediatric spine injuries. However, unlike adults, falls also account for a large portion um, of the injuries, followed by the gunshot wounds and sports injury. Um, whenever you see a pediatric injury, you need to keep in mind the possibility of non-accidental trauma as well. There are differences in the mechanisms based on the age between children and adolescents, with adolescents uh, mirroring the adult patterns um, that we see, while children tend to have a higher proportion of falls as compared to the adolescents um, and adults. Also, the location of injuries within the spine differs with age. Upper cervical injuries are overrepresented in the young, and again, the adolescents are more similar to the adult population. Uh, this is due to the different anatomic differences. The pediatric population have relatively underdeveloped neck muscles, as well as increased ligamentous laxity, which allows more motion at a given motion segment. They also have a large head-to-neck ratio, which, helps, which shifts the fulcrum of rotation um, more cephalate. The vertebral bodies are smaller, and the disc to vertebral body ratios are larger, owing partly to the immature non-ossified end plates. This also leads to more motion across a given motion segment. The facet joints are also shallower, with the angle of the facets being 30 degrees in the younger population, and then it, later in life it goes to 60 to 70 degrees by the age of 10, which is similar to the adult. This decreased slope also allows um, more translation across um, the level. Due to the larger head to trunk ratio, um, the, the flexion extension fulcrum is at C2, C3, and it slowly migrates down to C5, C6 by the age of um, 10. This is why you tend to see more upper cervical injuries um, in the younger patients. One key difference in the pediatric spine is that it is still growing, and just like everywhere else in the bodies, we have our um, ossification centers that eventually fuse. Ossification begins in utero and continues through adolescence. For example, the posterior arch fuses at age three, and this fuses to the anterior body by age seven. The C2 body fuses to the odontoid process at age seven. These could often be mistaken for trauma, but they're just the non-ossified centers. And so, as you can see over here, in this uh, non-ossified area, in the Odontoid, you could have injuries through them just like your Salter Harris fractures. The treatment goals of any trauma is to decompress what is compressed, stabilize what is unstable. 
However, in the pediatric population, you also want to limit growth disturbances and late deformity. For example, you would try to avoid doing an anterior fusion in the cervical spine of the pediatric population to not induce kyphosis with further growth. In terms of the acute workup, suspicion for spine injuries based on the initial history and physical examination. The, knowing the mechanism of injury and the presence of neurologic symptoms, even if they are transient, is very important. You should look for facial or head injuries and multi-system trauma should raise suspicion. Um, additionally, children have predisposing conditions such as syndromes, ligamentous laxity, or um, congenital cervical stenosis, which could pre predispose them for neuro neurologic injuries. Um, in addition, you need to look for non-continuous injury, especially since children could be poor historians. The spine should be immobilized in all patients with suspected trauma. The C-spine should be stabilized with a pediatric-sized cervical collar if available. Furthermore, due to the increased head-to-trunk ratio in the pediatric population, when you lay the pediatric patient flat, the, there is a flexion moment on the cervical spine and it is not in line. And therefore, pediatric spine boards have cutouts for the head to accommodate for this. If a pediatric spine board is not available, you could stack two boards in a staggered fashion to allow um, extra room for the occiput. In this MRI over here, you can see what could happen if the child's head is forced into flexion in the setting of an injury. Of course, detailed neurologic examination should be performed, but in patients under the age of three, there could be limited cooperation and it could be remarkably difficult. However, you need to get a thorough sensory exam and motor examination. This may be a good time to discuss findings that commonly mimic trauma but are normal in the pediatric population. The first situation is pseudosubluxation, particularly at C2, C3. This has been described to be seen in about 9 to 22% of the pediatric population. They, they could be distinguished from an actual injury through the spinal laminar line. Any disruption of the line greater than two millimeters indicates some sort of pathologic disruption. This is a true injury. Children under the age of eight are typically treated with closed reduction and halo vest, while those um, greater than eight to 10 generally require surgical fixation. I would also like to point out over here that our cutoffs uh, for the Atlanta dense interval in children under eight is also three to five millimeters as opposed to the adult. Um, the various growth plates or synchondroses may be interpreted as fractures. Though we certainly see injuries through these synchondroses, um, they are often just not injured and it is important to perform a thorough clinical evaluation to differentiate the two. Another common finding to note is the wedge appearing of the cervical vertebral bodies on CT. This is due to the non-ossified components that are radiolucent. Now, moving on to specific cervical injury patterns that are particular to injury patterns seen in children. Um, I will begin with the Atlanta occipital dissociations. These are highly unstable injuries with mortality rates up to 50%, particularly if the injury is missed initially. In fact, in the past, we had very little data about these injuries because most of these patients just didn't make it alive to the, to the hospital. Neurologic injury may be masked by a concomitant TBI, so you have to have a high index of suspicion. Um, MRI will, will show high evidence of soft tissue injuries. When looking, sorry, I'll go back. When looking at these CTs, you wanna see any asymmetries. In the CT I have up over here, you see increased occiput to cervical distance, as well as widening of the C1 to C2 posteriorly. Another interesting finding is if you look at the Atlanta dense interval, it's actually not parallel, but in a V-shape. And this is owing to the fact that usually the posterior aspect of the C1 arch migrates with the occiput, resulting in that angulation. You also wanna look at the joints 
for any asymmetry or any subluxation, as you can see in this, this CT over here, where you have angling of the C1, C2 joint, as well as subluxation of the OC joint. These generally require surgical fixation in the form of occiput to C2 fusion. Jumping back to the initial management, we often place uh, patients in cervical collars. This, this is very tricky in the situation of occipital cervical dissociation since the collars exhibit a distracting mechanism on the cervical spine. And here you can see one of our adult patients in a poorly fitted collar where you actually see distraction of the occipital cervical joint. Therefore, what I like to do is take sandbags or IV bags, put them on either side of the head and tape the head to the bed. In addition to not providing distraction across the OC joint, it also scares all the staff and prevents them from touching the patient. <laughs> um, this CT over here on the right is actually the CT of the same patient on the left, but without a cervical collar. This was taken a few hours later, and you can see a reduction of the occipital cervical joint. Dan's injuries, just like in the elderly, are also relatively common in the young. The injury could be through the dens itself or through the synchondrosis. Uh, these are generally treated with immobilization in a halo for six to eight weeks um, if alignment could be maintained. If these are missed, you may have a symptomatic osodontoidum if not recognized. Another injury pattern that is common in the young but we do not see in the adult is skiwara or a spinal cord injury without radiographic abnormalities. This was first described in the 80s and early 90s before the advent of MRI. And it was defined as objective signs of myelopathy as a result of trauma with the absence of fracture or ligamentous instability on CT or radiographs. Um, this is caused due to the hyperflexibility of the pediatric spine in a flexion extension mechanism where you actually um, have the vertebral body uh, pinch the cord between the posterior um, elements resulting in a spinal cord injury. These injuries account for 6% of pediatric spine injuries with 80% of them occurring in ages less than nine. Se several studies in the 80s and early 90s described these as late deterioration occurring between 30 minutes and 96 hours post-injury. One of the thoughts behind this is due to secondary swelling due to the inflammatory process. The initial recommendations include 12 weeks of bracing. With the advent of MRI, we, found, we obtained more information about this injury, and we saw that there is significant evidence of, non, of injury to the non-bony supporting structures, including ruptures of the different leg, ligaments, interspinal ligament tears, and through the discs. What further allows this is obviously the weaker muscles as well as the more horizontal facets that, we, that I described earlier, which allow more translation of the vertebral bodies. From these MRI evaluations, we now describe five classes of cord involvement. Uh, patients with full transaction and major hemorrhage had profoundly poor outcomes, but 40% with minor hemorrhage improved to mild grades, whereas 70% with edema only attained mild grades with 25% becoming normal. All patients with normal cord signals made a complete recovery. While initially um, immobilization was recommended for 12 weeks, more recent recommendation um, say that you could do early discontinuation in patients who are asymptomatic and have a stable spine on flexion and extension radiographs. However, it's still recommended to avoid high risk activities for up to six months. Unstable injuries should be treated surgically regardless of the court status. And I remind you, early discontinuation should only be in the asymptomatic and radiographically stable spine. So coming back to our treatment goals, they are to stabilize what is unstable, decompress ongoing compression, prevent further neurologic injury if present, limit growth disturbances, and prevent late deformity.
In placing a halo, kids have a softer skull and therefore require more pins inserted with less tor torque. Care is needed to avoid the supraorbital and supratorqueal nerves, as well as the thin bone under the temporalis muscle. When it comes to surgery, fusion is considered very challenging in children under the age of one due to their very narrow, narrow bony corridors, and generally pedicle screws are feasible after the age of four, but this requires careful preoperative planning. If operative fixation is chosen, one needs to consider the size of the available osseous structures, implant availability, and the implications of fixation on anticipated growth. This is truly done on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, for cases involving the upper cervical spine, the course of the vertebral artery needs to be verified using CT angio or MRI angio. I position my patients using a halo, and this is due to the patient's soft skull. While in the adult population, I tend to use the Mayfield attachment, which has three pin sites, but in the but in the pediatric population, you need more pin sites. And fiber optic intubation techniques should be used in unstable injuries. In this study by Gek and his colleagues evaluating um, upper cervical instrumentation in patients between the ages of two and six, they found that the occipital keel, C1 lateral masses, and C2 lamina offer adequate space for screw placement in almost all cases. However, C2 pedicles were considered safe for pedicle screws in only 50% of the case. C1, C2 transarticular screws were only feasible in 4% of the cases. I will now speak about thoracolumbar trauma. This tends to be a bit more similar to the adult population, but there are still differences. One of these is apophyseal ring injuries, which, unlike other pediatric injuries, are actually more common in the adolescents um, as opposed to um, children. And these mimic disc herniations. Um, the soft tissue components are often larger than what the CT would imply, and when symptomatic, would benefit from decompression. Axial loading injuries are also common in the pediatric population, and so compression fractures are generally treated non-operatively with pain control, and I personally do not use any bracing. Burst fractures are also generally treated non-operatively in the absence of uh, neurologic compression. However, surgery should be considered if there's significant kyphosis or neural element compression, and you could instrument with or without a fusion. Again, this is dependent on the specific case. Lap belt injuries or flexion distraction injuries are also quite common in the pediatric population and result from a disruption in the posterior ligamentous complex. You also need to evaluate for intra-abdominal injuries as there's a high association between the two. These injuries could be, mostly, could be mostly osseous in nature, in which case you could often treat them in a hyperextension brace conservatively, though in my mind this is often akin to treating a tibia with casting, or they could be primarily ligamentous, in which case I tend to treat them operatively. Um, in this case over here, you could see a 15-year-old um, patient with a flexion distraction injury treated percutaneously, one level above and one level below the injury. And if desired, the hard hardware could be fused after, it could be removed after about nine months to a year if there is solid bony healing of the injury. In summary, um, Kids are not just small adults, and you really need to understand the nuances of their differing anatomy and biomechanics. You need to perform a very thorough examination and have a high suspicion for injuries since kids are often poor historians. You need to understand the age-related anatomy and also understand that operative intervention requires careful planning on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you very much. Right. We have a few minutes for questions for Dr. Gendelberg. I'll, I'll lead off with uh, one um, regarding sort of secondary bleeding with spinal cord injury. You, 
sort of spoke about uh, the sclerosis and one of the mechanisms being kind of a blossoming bleed. Is there any thought um, that you've seen in either adult or pediatric patients to, um, you know, obviously we're going to correct coagulopathy, but sort of prophylactically use TXA or something else to prevent secondary bleeding? Or I mean, that, that's a very good question. And we still have that discussion in the adult population. And since spinal cord injuries are even less common in the pediatric population, there isn't much literature particular to that. And so one of the things that we often do in the adult population is also try to control perfusion pressures instead of increasing um, MAPs to, to help fight um, bleeding into the spinal cord. But there's very sparse literature when it comes to the pediatric population. Great, great talk and great cases. You know, you showed the, uh, the AO dislocation case, you know, highly unstable. Uh, the occiput basically, you know, gets pushed away by a collar. In those cases, can you let the audience know, our trainees, uh, how do you position the patient uh, when you try to flip them for the, you know, OC fusion? Uh, and uh, what protocol do you use? Uh, and two is that, you know, OC fusion to achieve a bony, solid bony orthodesis is always challenging yeah. given the real estate, especially in the occiput with the plate. Any tricks that you use to kind of maximize uh, your, your fusion success? Yeah, so, so that's actually a fabulous question because I'm very neurotic when it comes to positioning patients with OC dissociations. So I'll actually, if, once they come into the OR, I will get a lateral uh, CRM view of them on their stretcher to make sure that the OC uh, joint is somewhat in the ballpark. Then using spine precautions, I'll transfer them supine onto the OR bed. I'll get another um, CRM shot to make sure that there hasn't been any um, dislocation. And then I will put a Jackson frame, Jackson frame on top of them and sandwich the patient between the two frames and rotisserie, flip them, and then get another CRM shot. Obviously, I'll also get pre-flip and post-flip um, signals to assess no changes in neuromonitoring uh, signals. So that is a fabulous question, and I'm beyond neurotic when it comes to patient positioning. Um, another issue that isn't really spoken about when you do OC fusions is also gaze. And so I'll try to get the mandibular angle parallel to the an anterior aspect of the dens, and even sometimes I'll lay on the floor underneath the patient to make sure that they have a horizontal gaze. And when in doubt, I'd rather err, to, err in having the patient flexed forward more than extended because it makes walking easier. As far as fusion, um, kids tend to fuse better. Um, and I'll, full disclosure, I've only done an OC fusion on maybe one or two pediatric cases. Um, and Traditionally, you talk about putting iliac crest and wiring it down on top, and that is definitely a possibility. But in the pediatric population, I think just using your DBM and allograft works relatively well. Building, building on that, um, um, do, you, do, you, do you ever find a head holder? You obviously don't want to be in distraction, but do you find a head holder useful to just sort of stabilize the uh, OC joint, um, or, or it's just a prone, uh, just a prone view because it's, it's tough to sandwich somebody with a head holder. Uh, no, no. So, so I'll put pins um, mm -hmm. in the head. So in the pediatric population, I'll use the halo attachment. Uh -huh. In the adult population, I'll use a Mayfield. And actually, once I'm open up, I'll actually, I'll sometimes unscrub and I'll actually put axial compression mm -hmm. across the head to further reduce it, and that also helps with. Fusion, because you're able to compress more. Sure. You know, uh, Dr. Fessler did such a great job talking about the impact of trauma um, and spinal cord injury, and, and his population for the stem cell studies was all adults. But in kids, as you, as you know, the impact, a lifetime impact yeah. is, is even magnified. So any differences in your protocols, for example, using steroids, your threshold to use steroids, and any differences, uh, perfusion pressures that you might do with a pediatric patient compared to an adult? So I don't have um, specific um, recommendations for um, 
perfusion pressures. However, I'm glad you brought up the topic of steroids. Over the past uh, few years, there's kind of been a move away from steroids, but I think steroids are appropriate in the, in the right patient. Um, generally uh, speaking, um, if patients um, have high morbidity, a lot of chronic diseases, lung injuries, I tend to shy away from steroids. However, in a young, healthy patient within eight hours of injury, um, I will absolutely use steroids. And I've done that on a number of occasions, not that often, because I think the benefits of steroids in those cases outweigh the potential risk, but it's really a case-by-case -case basis. David, is that any level or? The what? Is that any level that you'd use steroids or like the cervical or thoracic or? Um, no, no, no. So I, I tend to use it more in the cervical level because each, the literature, if you look at the NASCA studies, show improvement of around one level with the use of steroids. And so getting an extra level in the thoracic spine is not that consequential. But in the cervical spine, it could be the difference between you being able to do independent transfers and being entirely wheelchair bound. So definitely the cervical spine, um, I'm more aggressive than in the thoracic spine. Great question, thank you. Right, great. Thank you. Thank you.